Good morning. Welcome to St. Paul's Lutheran Church as we celebrate here in the season of Pentecost the work of the Holy Spirit. And we're especially doing that here in this series as we look at what the Holy Spirit does through the Word. This week we're taking a look at, really, it's the heart of Christianity, that through the Word, the Holy Spirit delivers forgiveness of sins. And that's something that we all very need very much and appreciate very much. And we'll talk about that appreciation today as well. And as we gather and and worship for this, we also recognize that it is the word that speaks to us. And so our opening hymn, Speak, O Lord, that's hymn 735, it's printed for you here in the worship folder. May God bless you and your worship today. Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. Amen.
Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father, asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by His authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, protector of all the faithful, you alone make strong, you alone make holy. Show us your mercy and forgive our sins day by day. Guide us through our earthly lives that we do not lose the things you have prepared for us in heaven. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. seated. We now go to the word that delivers us forgiveness, and we see that happen in 2 Chronicles chapter 33. We have someone who here who learned of what the Lord's forgiveness not only means, but what it can do for his life. Manasseh was 12 years old when he became king, and he ruled as king in Jerusalem for 55 years. He did evil in the eyes of the Lord by following the disgusting practices of the nations which the Lord had driven out before the people of Israel. He rebuilt the high places which his father Hezekiah had torn down. He erected altars to the Baals and made Asherah poles. He worshipped the whole army of the heavens and served them. He built altars in the house of the Lord about which the Lord had said, In Jerusalem my name will be forever. He built altars for the whole army of the heavens in the two courtyards of the house of the Lord. He made his sons pass through the fire in the valley of the son of Hinnom. He practiced fortune-telling 
and sought omens and consulted mediums and spiritists. He greatly increased the evil deeds he did in the eyes of the Lord and provoked him to anger. The Lord spoke to Manasseh and to his people, but they paid no attention. So the Lord brought the officials of the army of the king of Assyria against them. They led Manasseh captive with hooks. They bound him with bronze shackles and took him to Babylon. When he was in distress, he sought the favor of the Lord his God and humbled himself deeply before the God of his fathers. He prayed to the Lord, and the Lord responded to his prayer and heard his plea for mercy. He brought him back to Jerusalem and to his own kingdom. Then Manasseh knew that the Lord is the true God. Afterward, he built an outer wall for the city of David in the valley from west of the Gihon Spring up to the entrance by the fish gate. He encircled Ophel with it and raised it to a very great height. He also put commanders of the army in all the fortified cities in Judah. He removed the foreign gods and the idol from the house of the Lord. He removed all the altars he had built on the mountain of the house of the Lord and in Jerusalem and threw them outside of the city. He restored the altar of the Lord and offered sacrifices of fellowship offerings and thank offerings on it. He commanded Judah to serve the Lord, the God of Israel. Nevertheless, the people still sacrificed at the high places, but only to the Lord their God. You can find the rest of the acts of Manasseh, his prayer to his God, and the words of the seers who spoke to him in the name of the Lord, the God of Israel, in the annals of the kings of Israel. The word of the Lord. We join together in a blessed psalm, Psalm 32 on page 78.
The second lesson comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where we find just how much of a change in status and in who we are comes with forgiveness from God. Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor males who have sex with males, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor the verbally abusive, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And some of you were those types of people, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. The word of the Lord. In the Bible, oftentimes you'll hear the word saints, and to understand that word properly, we know that it means those who are holy, thanks to the blood of Jesus. And we have a psalm, Psalm 132 here, the verse of the day that really brings that out. We say it together. Alleluia, may your priests be clothed with righteousness, may your saints sing for joy, Alleluia. Please stand in honor of the gospel. The gospel for today comes from Luke chapter 7. This will also serve as our sermon text for today. A certain one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. Jesus entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Just then, a sinful woman from that town learned that he was reclining in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume, stood behind him near his feet weeping, and began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she began to wipe them with her hair, while also kissing his feet and anointing them with perfume. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet... He would realize who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, because she is a sinner. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. He said, Teacher, say it. A certain moneylender had two debtors. The one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? Simon answered, I suppose the one who had the larger debt forgiven. Then he told him, you have judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, do you see this woman? I entered your house, but you did not give me water for my feet. Yet she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss. But she, from the time I entered, has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. Therefore I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That is why she loved so much. But the one who is forgiven little, loves little. Then Jesus said to her, your sins have been forgiven. Those reclining at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? He said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. The Gospel of the Lord. We confess our faith publicly in that gospel together with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated, and if there are any children who'd like to come up for a children's message, you can meet me right up here at the front steps. Any other children at heart? <laughs> Just you and me, Hank. We got it. Morning. How you doing? Good. Hank, do you know what a push-up is? Do you think you could do a push-up right now? <laughs> He's like, yeah, I want to do one. I know you, Hank. Can you do a push-up for us? Go ahead. Nice. Well, that's good form. That's well done. Nicely done. What if I told you that you had to do a push-up for every time that you've disobeyed your parents. <laughs> Sore arms, Dad said. What if I told you you had to do a push-up also for every time you were ever mean to somebody? What if I told you that you had to also do a push-up for every time you were ever even just angry? Would you want to do that many push-ups? No. <laughs> no, I don't think anybody would. Can you imagine if you look back all your life, and those are just three types of sins. Can you imagine how many push-ups you would have to do for that? Now, what if I told you that there was somebody else, your dad, who came and said, I will do every one of those push-ups for you? Would you be happy about that? Yeah, <laughs> you'd be relieved, would you feel like, whew, that's a weight off my shoulders, right? But now, all right, taking it even a step further, what if it wasn't just a push-up for every sin? What if it was an eternity in hell? Now, that's a punishment you would never want to face, right? For every single sin. And yet, who came along and said, I will take that punishment for every single sin? Jesus did. Jesus died on the cross, paying for every single moment that you deserve to spend in hell. Are you pretty thankful for that? It kind of makes you overflow with appreciation, doesn't it? And, and that's the whole point today. It's, it's through the word. God proclaims to you, Hank, that your every sin is forgiven, all paid for by Jesus on the cross. And now our response to that is we get to change things that we do. So now, you can obey your parents because you know that that's what God would want you to do. Now you can be nice to people because that's what God wants us to do too, to improve things for them. And that also means then, instead of anger, we get to show love to them and patience, just like God did with us. We get to forgive other people's sins as he forgave ours too. I'll say a prayer asking God for help with that. Lord God, we praise you for sending your son to take our punishment, something that we could never pay off. Thank you that not only have you proclaimed that to us and brought us to faith in that, but now that you have changed our hearts through that message. Guide us in appreciation, Lord, and deeper our appreciation so that we can see just the depth of what Jesus did and just how much we get to do now out of love for you. Bless Hank, bless the congregation as we all show that love. We ask everything in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, you can head back to your seats. Thank you. Well done with the push-up. Continue with the hymn of the day, Jesus, your boundless love for me, hymn 479.
Grace and complete peace are yours, thanks to Jesus Christ, our Lord, who came to die for you. Amen. The sermon text for today comes from the Gospel in Luke chapter 7, if you'd like to follow along as we go. Let us pray. O oh Lord, open our minds and our hearts to your word so that we can see your boundless love for us. Amen. The American Psychological Association says that money is the greatest source of stress among Americans. In a survey they conducted, they found that 72% of Americans face some sort of stress about money throughout the past month. And the majority of those respondents said that it was a significant source of stress. That's understandable when you consider that total household debt in America is $15.84 trillion. That's an average debt of $62,000 per American adult. And that's eight out of every ten Americans that have some sort of debt. It's a lot of debt. That's a lot of stress. That's quite the heavy burden on a mind and our heart when you have to pay off a loan. And conversely, it's quite the load off and the relief when that burden is gone, when you pay off a loan. Anyone here have the joy and the relief of ever having that feeling of paying off a loan? Isn't freedom from debt a wonderful feeling? Now imagine that you owe a debt that is astronomical. You couldn't possibly pay it off in a gajillion lifetimes. And then the person that you owed completely canceled the debt. It'd be quite the load off, wouldn't it? It'd be quite the freeing feeling. Whew. Well, today in the gospel, we're going to find two people, two different people, a Pharisee and a woman. And we're going to see them confronted with such a debt. We're going to analyze their interactions with Jesus. And we're going to answer the question, which of them will love more? And then connected with that question, we're going to ask ourselves, which of them am I most like? Now, we know it wasn't because of financial burden, but it seems that Jesus was just never one to turn down a dinner invitation. He dined in the house of tax collectors, such as Matthew and Zacchaeus. And on the complete other end of the spectrum, he even dined in the house of Pharisees. And that's where we find him here at the end of Luke chapter 7. A certain one of the Pharisees asked Jesus to eat with him. Jesus entered the Pharisee's house and reclined at the table. Now back in that day when you had a dinner like this, you had a, a, a table very low to the ground, and you actually reclined at the table. You would you would recline on your left side so that you could have your, your arm and hand free for handling food. And it was kind of slantwise out from the table with your feet sticking way out from the table like that. Just then, a sinful woman from that town learned that he was reclining in the Pharisee's house. She brought an alabaster jar of perfume, stood behind him near his feet, weeping, and began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she began to wipe them with her hair while also kissing his feet and anointing them with the perfume. So this woman who wasn't invited comes into this house where they're having a dinner party. That actually, by the way, was not uncommon. That's not the strange part. People could, if there was a dinner party, go in and actually sit along the wall and take in the conversation of whatever dinner was happening. 
What was strange was that this woman was infamous for being a sinner in the town. And she went into the house of a Pharisee who was having dinner. Pharisees were those group of Jews that looked down on everyone else because they thought they kept God's law to a T. They even kept all of these man-made laws that they had added on top of it. And so they thought everybody else had this lack of righteousness that they had. And we see that here next. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would realize who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, because she is a sinner. Now we learn a few things from this verse. First, like I just said, Pharisees tended to look down on people. The Pharisee actually looked at this woman as someone not just who was a sinner, but someone you wouldn't even want to touch you. Secondly, we learn about the nature of his dinner invitation to Jesus. He didn't believe Jesus was who he was saying he was. He seemed to invite Jesus just because Jesus was Mr. Popular, or maybe even because he was, as a Pharisee, trying to trap Jesus like they often were. So really, he had no faith in Jesus, and that's important for the context to come. Third, we find out that he says this to himself. Luke literally says he says in himself. So he's thinking this, which means that when Jesus responds to it next, Jesus is trying to show him that he was indeed truly a prophet and could hear his thoughts. But Jesus was also a really good, patient teacher who was willing to give a lesson to anybody who needed to hear it. Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. He said, Teacher, say it, teacher, not Lord, note. A certain moneylender had two debtors. The one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. When they could not pay, he forgave them both. So which of them will love him more? It's a pretty simple, straightforward parable. A denarius was a day's wages. So a 500 denarii debt would be about, think of what you would have for a year and a third wages. Versus the other person who had 50 denarii debt, so roughly about a month and two-thirds wages. A couple significant debts, but one far more than the other. So answer was pretty simple, straightforward. And the Pharisee knew this, and so he could sense the trap. He knew that there was something coming up, so he answered, I suppose the one who had the larger debt forgiven. He played along, but he made sure to kind of leave it so that he wouldn't be trapped by this elementary solution. Or so he thought. Then Jesus told him, you have judged correctly. Turning toward the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house, but you did not give me water for my feet. Yet she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but she from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with perfume. It was customary in that day when you held a dinner and invited a guest of honor that you would do certain things for them. You would provide water at the door to wash their feet. Usually there was a servant there that would wash the feet as well. You'd also greet them with a kiss, like many cultures do today still, on the cheek. You would also anoint their head with oil. It was a sign of hospitality and of blessing and of honor for the honored guest. This Pharisee did none of that. He was a very crummy host. And he didn't make Jesus feel welcome, much less honored. Contrast that with the woman. The woman provided water for Jesus' feet, all right. Her very tears that were pouring out of her, out of repentance and joy. She obviously heard about who Jesus was, what that meant for her, and the forgiveness that she had of her great sins. Not just that, 
She didn't just kiss him. She was kissing his feet over and over again as she wiped them clean. Even more than that, she brought this alabaster jar of perfume to anoint not Jesus' head, but his feet even. And an alabaster jar of perfume had this long, skinny neck that in order to open it, you'd have to break it. So this was a one-time, all-to-the-Lord type of offering. So which of them loved more? It's obvious. The woman proved her love for Jesus. Look at all the things that she did. She realized her sins were forgiven. It was like this debt, this weight was lifted off of her shoulders and she had complete relief. And it was that sense of relief that drummed up this appreciation to do all of these things for Jesus. The Pharisee didn't even realize he had a debt to be paid. And if someone forgives a debt that you don't even realize, well, you're not even going to show much appreciation at all in the first place. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That is why she loved so much. But the one who is forgiven little loves little. So who are you most like? The woman or the Pharisee? Either way you look at it, it's bad for us. When you take a look in the mirror that is provided by the Pharisee, a lot of obvious sins come forward. You realize how much we look down on other people. God is very clear in his word that life is to be protected and that only he is to take a life and that abortion is wrong. But so are we when we are filled with anger and yell and scream in someone's face who argues for abortion or viciously slander them to their face or with others or on social media or even within our own hearts and minds. I think to myself, well, I have the right to do that. I'm speaking up for truth and life. And look at them. They're the nasty sinners arguing for this. Just like a good Pharisee. In fact, we puff ourselves up so much, we often forget that we need forgiveness. We think to ourselves, well, what debt? God's pretty lucky to have me in this kingdom. So we go about our lives as if, well, God is the one to show love to me, not vice versa. And it shows in our lives. Then we look at the mirror that is provided by the woman, and it doesn't get much better. You know, the Pharisee denied Jesus, didn't have faith in him, didn't see him as the Son of God and Savior of the world. Like the woman, we do. Yet look at her response to the gospel and look at ours. This woman was pouring out tears upon Jesus' feet. Yet you and I can yawn during the confession of sins. This woman was kissing his feet over and over and over again out of appreciation and yet you and I can zone out during the song of praise and the absolution that comes after. This woman was anointing Jesus' feet with very expensive perfume. In fact, she sought him out in a Pharisee's house to do so. Yet you and I can praise Jesus when it fits our schedules or we withhold our best so that we can go on fancier summer vacations. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven. That is why she loved so much. But the one who is forgiven little, loves little. She proved her love for Jesus, proved that she had indeed been forgiven. Yet you and I, with our little love, 
wonder, have we? So you ask that question, who do I look like the most? Either way you look at it, it's not good for us. And then you'll go back to that original question. Which of them will love more? It isn't us. But that's why it's kind of a trick question. When I asked that question, which of them will love more, you thought I was talking about the Pharisee or the woman? Did the Pharisee love more? Well, that's obvious, no. <laughs> but it wasn't the woman either. The one who loved most was the teacher who was right there with him. And he proved that yet again as he dismisses the woman. Then Jesus said to her, Your sins have been forgiven. She knew that, but she needed to hear it again personally from him, so he did. He pronounced it to her. Then those reclining at the table with him began to say among themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Pharisees gonna Pharisee. They thought they were sticking up for God's word because only God is allowed to forgive sins. They didn't realize that God, right there in the sinner's house, was having his feet washed by another sinner. And Jesus shows his gracious patience by ignoring their sin-filled denial and focusing still on the woman. He said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. He removes all and every burden from her shoulders by giving her the one thing that she wanted most of all. He proclaimed to her the one thing she needed from whom the, the one that she owed this great debt, he proclaimed peace. Free from spiritual stress, complete peace with God. And here the God-man speaks again today through me to you. Brother, sister, your sins have been forgiven. Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Go in peace, knowing that that peace was won for you not by the washing of Jesus' feet with tears from a woman, but by the tears that he shed as he paid for every sin on the cross. You have been saved not by the hospitable kiss of someone upon Jesus' face, but through the kiss of a traitor, as that was part of God's plan to save you. You have been forgiven not because of an expensive anointing with perfume upon Jesus' feet, but with an expensive anointing of his own blood upon his feet shed for you. Those were the same feet that made sure to walk a perfect path so that you could be gifted his perfect righteousness through faith. Your debt is paid. You're forgiven by God. Isn't freedom from debt a wonderful feeling? Which of them will love more? Thankfully, the answer to that question will always be Jesus. And thankfully then, the answer to that question, which of them can I be most like, the Pharisee or the woman, that's easy for us too. With such love shown to us, now we can show great love back to him. Amen. Please stand. May the peace won by Jesus our Savior on the cross guard your hearts and minds through faith in him. Amen. We now sing about that peace and ask for God's help.
may be seated. We bring forward the offering. Now join together in the prayer of God's church, and that is a prayer that includes prayers for health challenges, that includes those like Barry Weirs. We also pray for those celebrating birthdays this week, Andrew Parr, Dale Hesselberg, Harrison Moe, Artis Urbanic, Jim Craner, Krista Paff, Marilyn Johnson, Chad Anderson, Corey Johnson, Jason Dow, Alexander Lindsay, John Langer, Leslie Miller, Patricia Anderson, Doris Mushik and Cheryl Langer. We also pray for those celebrating anniversaries, Boyd and Cheryl Dow, Quinn and Clara Handy, Todd and Gwen Menke, and Ryan and Dana Brown. Join together. O oh Lord, our God, you are wise and powerful, good and gracious. Your mercies are new every morning. Each day you open your hand and provide for the needs of your children on earth. Strengthen your church in all the world. Let your comforting message of salvation in Christ Jesus be proclaimed to troubled souls everywhere. Use our ministries and offerings to extend your healing and your hope. We bring you our requests for the various structures of our society. Bless our national, state, provincial, and local governments. Grant prosperity to our businesses and industries. Give employers a sense of fairness toward their workers and employees a feeling of joy and pride in their workmanship. Help us find satisfaction in all work well done. Invigorate the schools of our land. Give success to every effort that helps students read, think, and communicate in ways that will promote an informed and responsible citizenry. Arouse curious minds to discover the wonders of your created order. Strengthen the families of our country. Give fathers and mothers a renewed commitment to be good parents. Give children and young people the wisdom to regard their parents as your representatives. Lead us to love one another as you have loved us. Merciful Lord, please hold the glory of your promises before the eyes of all who are faced with health challenges. Let your power and presence give them strength and remind them often of your daily and eternal care. Lord, we praise you for the joy of those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries this week. Renew in them the joy of your grace, that they may continue to praise you with their lives. Now hear us, Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. Gracious Father, we pray boldly as Jesus taught, with the confidence that you will hear and with the faith that you will respond for our welfare. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus was our Lamb of God. We sing about that next with the hymn printed for you in the bulletins.
Please stand for prayer and to receive the blessing. We pray. Almighty God, grant to your church the Holy Spirit and the wisdom that comes from above. Let nothing hinder your word from being freely proclaimed to the joy and edifying of Christ's holy people, so that we may serve you in steadfast faith and confess your name as long as we live. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. May be seated for our closing hymn number 330. Good morning again. God is good. Always good to praise him here with you. A few announcements for you. Uh, First of all, throughout the summer, maybe you've noticed, and I failed to announce it, but uh, there's a fellowship hour sort of in between services. Uh, Usually in the summer, it's difficult to find people to sign up to bring cookies or or such or snacks. Um, So we will provide coffee during fellowship hour, and we might have some cookies here or there. If you'd still like to sign up, you can contact the the administrators for that, but um, just a note that fellowship hour will take place. We'll have some coffee, so you are invited downstairs uh, if you'd like to stay and hang out. We'll have a gift card shower continuing here for the Lindemans, so that box once again there in the narthex, so please um, consider that as we welcome them here. They're actually going to be here later this afternoon as they drive down to kind of get to know the area as they look for a house. 
Um, John's brother Mike is a pastor in Lewiston, so they're going to get to see them as well. So uh, God be praised, we'll, we'll meet them this, this afternoon. The quarterly voters meeting has been scheduled for July 10th. That's after the second service at 11.15 a.m. down in the church basement. St. Paul's will be at the county fair again. That'll be July 20th, Wednesday, the first day of the fair, from 5 to 10 p.m. If you're able to help out at any part of that, let us know. Also, we'll, um, we are accepting donations for different things like school supplies that like to, we like to give out as prizes and, and other things. So if, if you're willing to give a donation of some sort, please contact myself or Bart Horseman. And it seems that everyone's retreating. There's lots of retreats going on, so if you take a look in the news and announcements, you can see lots of opportunities where if you need to get together with some Christians, have some good fellowship, get away from some difficulties in life, and maybe get some good encouragement, uh, it's a good place to do that. So lots of different opportunities for that. Please check those out. And now we'll watch this month's edition of The Wells Connection. Hi, I'm Wells President Mark Schrader. Education makes a difference, not just in academic achievement, but also in developing Christian character. A powerful illustration of how education can transform lives is on display at Kingdom Prep, a new Wells Area Lutheran High School in Milwaukee. When we got started, it's hard as a new school coming into a space and just saying, okay, make us number one on your list, right? It started off with eighth grade young men coming to build a high school. And so these eighth grade young men came to Wednesday night founders groups and they started designing one at a time uh, the mascot, the school day, what we would wear, uh, where we would go on Exploration Thursday trips. How do we create a space to be able to continue to serve kids from the city? How do we make uh, young men who are ready to be men of the kingdom? Anybody else got something that they want to say from what Mr. Spurrier was talking about when he was last up here? Cam, what you got for me? Loud and proud. We now have about 200 young men, and you now have these originally eighth graders. They're now the seniors who've gotten much bigger, much stronger, uh, much more biblically centered, and they are now raising up the next generation of freshmen who will come in here next and carry on the legacy. Oh, it's all boys school. I was already struggling in middle school because, you know, there's females distracting me. All right, I'm going to an all guys area. Think of it as a football team and everything runs smoothly. And so when we first uh, came up with the idea of an all boys school, we like brotherhood. We want to be brothers. We want to be a family. Even with our lunch, we have a family style lunch where everybody comes to sit down at the table, we have a table captain. You wanna work with your family through the hard times, the good times, you know, the bad times. You always with your family. The next line, lazy hands make for what? Poverty. Poverty, true? Apostle Paul says, carry each other's burdens, and in so by doing, you fulfill the law of Christ, which is obviously to love one another. The way that we built brotherhood through Christ and God is like really important because He's like the main building block. He's what we all base ourselves around. And like being able to talk to other guys about that is one of the best parts about the school. I have a group of people that I can talk to about religion or if I'm struggling, they're always there to talk to me. They'll bring up Bible verses or anything like that. Or you're on your game all the time and you keep on missing Bible study because you're on your phone or on your game. So whatever hurts my brother hurts me. So if my brother needs help with something, I'm going to be there to help him out. We're only as strong as our weakest link, right? Uh, we're here to constantly be being able to bend over and pick a brother up. Fixing whatever traumas and things that they've experienced within themselves. Counseling is a big piece around here. And how do we allow them to be able to express themselves? We live in a city where like, there's a lot of bad influences, and you're not really able to be yourself. You're not able to be vulnerable. I'll preach the gospel to them, right? But I'll then I'll give them some practical wisdom in here and say, young man. I was pretty down on the situation I was in, and coming here, it grew my faith with God because as I was in a low place in life, um, 
I went to God. Your personal mission statement should be timeless. And then the realization of, I need my Lord to get me through these tough times, and it helped a lot build my um, faith. Number two, you can find truth for your life by reading God's Word. Because you know, everybody has stuff going on at home or things in general, and like being able to go to a place where you can feel comfortable and like be vulnerable, talk to people without being judged. We're preparing young men for leadership, uh, for trade school, for college, for entrepreneurship, you name it. I plan on going to culinary school. I plan on going to Northwestern Michigan. They have a really good uh, culinary program. I want to help out students. I want to help people get the things that I wasn't able to have. I love to just give back to the future generations, basically. So MLC, it's a school for teachers. It'll help me keep my faith while I'm still up there. And two, I can still play football. All the things that I've learned, aside from academics, like all the life lessons teachers have taught me, all the good values and principles, I'm bringing out all with me as well. They're starting to recognize what does it mean to live in this kingdom first and foremost. Uh, I think it's going to pay off in big ways. I think they're going to be husbands to their wives, fathers to children, um, community leaders, certainly church, you know, congregational leaders. It's going beyond just getting a diploma. It's beyond just the work that you pour in. But how are you intrinsically a better young man? But to be able to do a, a work from my heart, and to continue to live towards his glory and everything that I do, like, you can't beat it, man. You can't beat it. Your personal mission statement will help you to maintain your balance. I would dare say the first and best thing we have going for us is kingdom first, the word first, right? And after that, everything else kind of falls into place. We're doing this for Christ. And so that's where the kingdom part comes in. You know, we all are doing it to serve Christ. So that's what it's all about. Kingdom Prep is four years old, which means the first class of students has become the first class of graduates, heading out into the world to serve the kingdom. And overall enrollment at our Wells Lutheran Elementary Schools and area high schools is up 10% this year, a tremendous blessing that means thousands of additional children are hearing about Jesus every day. God be praised that we get to be a part of that here with our St. Paul's School. Well, may God bless you with the forgiveness that Jesus brings now and always. Please greet one another.